Uh, but things that spin explode if you spin them fast enough. There's no exception to this. Sometimes people are confused with my reaction. They call me and go, hey man, Robert, man, one of these turbos just popped. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> You're not surprised? I'm like, am I surprised that you could explode a turbo? No, oh. I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> it's quite possible to have to do it. You know? Conventional marketing and all that stuff would have you think that, oh, like, ball bearing's better, if, you know, this is, you know, you want the ball bearing one because it's cool. No one's ever explained, at least to me, that there's a real advantage, application advantage for a journal bearing turbo. Oh, there's lots of, yeah, there definitely is. Is that why you use journal bearing stuff for street applications That's like that? That's why you pretty much always just get to use journal bearing stuff for street applications. Yeah, you you almost that. never really need to put ball bearing stuff into a street car application, uh, especially for Chevrolet, okay, because we're just not gonna get the G-forces necessarily. Um, and, and, and the, another reason it works, journal bearing work in the, in the LS stuff is because for the most part, you're moving over to S 400s S 400 bearings are huge. So if there's advantages to the journal bearing, why would you want a ball bearing unless you're in the scenario where you have the G force and the wheelie, you know, what, why, why, what's the, what's the good part about a ball bearing besides that? If you follow all the rules, uh, for a journal bearing operation and you follow all the rules for a ball bearing operation, the ball bearing lasts a lot longer. It, 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 even, if, even if you're not committing a foul, if you're not committing a foul, the, there's extended longevity out of the ball bearing. And um, the only thing that gets in the way of that is ball bearing applications where there's not any water cooling present because you, it, over about a, about a 12 to 18 month period, there's enough oil coking inside the turbocharger that it actually coaxes and locks the ball bearing into place and it can't float in an oil film anymore. This has an effect on the vibrations of the shaft and the rotor group because that oil film around the outside of the bearing that's now all hard coked oil, that used to be a damper sleeve around the ball bearing cartridge, okay? Mm. So, so as the rotor turned and, and uh, as it spun and vibrated and the car jumped over Dukes of Hazard bridges that were out and stuff like that, there was this little hydraulic film around the sleeve that damped the peaks off of the vibrations for the rotor group. When that goes away, and now all the vibrations for the ball bearing rotor group just get physically directly transmitted to the bearing housing, the bearing where it goes like whoop, hmm. and they'll die pretty quick after that. In the case of a ball bearing turbocharger, you restrict the amount of oil that goes through the turbocharger. So what you end up with is a frying pan with just a little bit of butter in it on the stove. Hmm. What, is that? what happens to that after a while? <laughs> if you leave it there too long, you can't fry an egg anymore, right? It's yeah. all nasty. You know? Well, that's what the inside of the turbo ends up looking like when you can't run water to the turbocharger and you don't have a journal bearing full flow delivery of oil going through there. That when you have a journal bearing style, high volume of oil going through the cartridge, it really helps keep the cartridge temperature down because that oil is cooling along with lubricating. There's so much volume of that oil going through there that it takes a lot of the heat out of the turbocharger, okay? Uh, in cases where you have a ball bearing turbocharger with very limited oil delivery, see oil is kind of an enemy almost to the ball bearing turbochargers because if the ball is running around the race at a million miles an hour and if, it, and if the race is flooded with oil, the, the ball wants to hydroplane. It doesn't even want to roll on the race anymore. It's supposed to skid, it wants to skid and try to float. You know, it's just like going down the highway too fast with, uh, with, with the wrong tires and there's a puddle of water. Hmm. You, you, you end up on top of the water instead of you know, uh, driving through the water. So it's a resistance. You, you, you hit a big puddle of water in your car and you feel it. You feel the deceleration of the car. It's the same effect on a ball bearing. So you, you really always limit and restrict the volume of oil delivered to a ball bearing turbocharger so that you're not slowing the, you're not slowing the rotor grip down. All that oil in there gets in the way. A ball bearing needs a mist of oil. It needs oil present. It doesn't need a flood of flowing oil. Hmm. The journal bearings are like that air hockey game you played when you were a kid, right? You turn the switch on, the air pump starts, you put the huck, puck, puck, puck on the deck, and it just glides right across, right? Hmm. It really fast, no friction. There's no heat. You know, the puck doesn't set on fire yeah. from touching the, the deck of the thing because there's no friction. It, it's floating, okay? Yeah. But if that puck is coming right towards your goal and you turn the air pump off right as that puck is coming in, the puck won't make it all the way to the goal because now, now it's 
direct contact between the two pieces instead of having that film between them. And in a turbocharger, the film's not the air, it's the motor oil, okay? And, and, uh, and we don't have a puck in a table, we have a shaft and a bearing or a bearing and a housing. And you need to keep those pieces from touching. There has to be a pressure film of oil between those pieces for them to float on. Hmm. And when there's not, those pieces touch, well, dang it, man, that's the highest speed you have of any moving pieces in your whole car is the surface difference, the speed difference between like a bearing, a bearing shaft and the bearing, the bearing and the housing, the thrust collar and the thrust bearing. That turbo's going 140,000 RPM. Even though the collar's only a half inch diameter, that ends up with some freaking surface speed. Okay, you divide by a small number of inches for the radius there, but if it's going 140,000 RPM, you can still divide by a small number and get a high speed. Yeah. And that's what you get. And you burn up those bearings really quick. Uh, yeah, you, that looks really cool. You got two tires in the air right that, right? But if you're data logging oil pressure at 2000 Hertz, when you did that, you lifted those two tires in the air, you're, you can watch the bubbles go past the oil pressure sensor. Hmm. You know, and, and maybe that didn't hurt a rod bearing. Maybe that didn't hurt a cam bearing. Maybe it did hurt a cam bearing. Nobody with an LS is gonna care. <laughs> okay, but, but it is definitely gonna hurt a turbo bearing. Okay, because the turbo bearing was going about 500 miles an hour. Uh, I, that's not right. That's, I'm just saying a lot. And, and then the oil went away. So just like that puck coming for your goal, if you turn the air off, it goes screeches to a stop right there. And you know the puck's not coming fast enough to start a fire on an air hockey table, but the turbocharger's spinning fast enough to start a fire right inside that turbocharger if there's no oil in that thrust bearing when it's spinning 140,000 RPMs, it's got 25 pounds of boost on it. You know, and, and here's, another, here's another shortcoming of ball bearing turbochargers, okay? If you had ball bearing turbocharger uh, on an eight millimeter shaft, so something like GT28 size or you know, like 300 horsepower per turbo kind of size, that, that sort of size range, okay? Um, that, rotor group, the, the diameter of that, those rotor, that rotor group, the compressor and turbine is very small, okay, and the speed is very high, see, so we don't talk about like there's an RPM limit for, uh, for the turbos, we talk about there being a tip speed limit for the turbos, because it's, it's, the, it's the magnitude of that tip speed that decides whether or not the part is going to explode. You know, you, if you got a cast iron flywheel, they explode sometimes, right, if you rev them up too high? Yeah, yeah, well that's because you exceeded the structural limit of the part. Uh, just from the geometry on it based on the material it's made out of. You spun it fast enough to explode it. Actually happens with anything, okay? You need to explode a CD-ROM if you spin it fast <laughs> enough. There's some neat videos of that on the internet too. Uh, but things that spin explode if you spin them fast enough. There's no exception to this anywhere. Yeah. Okay? Uh, you know, it's just funny when it's like, sometimes people are confused with my reaction. They call me and go, hey man, Robert, man, one of these turtles just popped. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, you're not surprised? I'm like, am I surprised that you could explode a turbo? No, oh. I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> it's quite possible to have to do it. You know, there's a number of ways which you can, you know, uh, cause that to happen uh, prematurely or unintentionally, and not even be trying. Boost leak's the easiest one. You know, when you get a boost leak, what's the first thing somebody does? Well, let me just. You know, they don't know it's a boost leak, right? For some reason, I just it's not making the same boost it used to. What's the first thing you're gonna do, man? You gonna flip that laptop up and you're gonna go duty cycle up arrow, up arrow, up arrow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What you just did was take the thing that was already trying to meet a target, pumping through the engine and the leak, and now you said, now pump more through the leak. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it does. It does until it explodes. You know, and people go, I was only running 20 pounds boost. I don't know how I could overspeed it. <laughs> maybe there's a torn coupler. Maybe there's an intercooler that's got a weld broke on it. Maybe you haven't found it. I've checked everything. If you'd have checked everything, you wouldn't be calling me asking me what's wrong. You'd have found it already. Okay? <laughs> you would call a dude in Texas that hadn't even seen what's underneath your hood. You wouldn't call me and ask me what was going on if you checked everything already. Yeah. You'd have found it. So that's funny. But yeah, just, but okay. So the advantage there on the small stuff is uh, there's there is RPM limits for ball bearings. Okay, so if you have like an eight millimeter ball bearing setup, you really can't drive that any faster about 180 thousand RPM without being outside the operating range of the bearing. So when you go down to smaller turbochargers like uh, stuff you find on uh, like two little twin turbos on a three liter inline six or a tiny little turbo that you see on a side-by-side -side, like a Can MX3 or something. Those things can go over 200,000 RPM. You cannot put a ball bearing in that. Ball bearings won't work at that kind of high shaft speed. That actually has to be a journal bearing. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of places where journal bearings are a better choice than ball bearings for sure. That's you might want it due to budget. You might want it due to what you're predicting your shaft speeds are gonna be.
ports on these are for water that's your water jacket yeah this is your water jacket uh it, and it goes it's a full circle all the way under the heat shield uh, if you look at a cross section of this you can go to the zona rotor website and look at a cross section image of this you can see how big that water jacket is it's one of the huge focuses of this product is dealing with 24 hour steady state thermal loading um we we this is we we consider this a motorsports grade turbocharger so this could be operated in a motorsports type manner with full 100 percent duty cycle operation on boost pressure that's what the that's what the pound a minute ratings indicate you're you're, you're being in told what your 100 percent duty cycle operating flow rate for the limit for the turbo is hmm. so when you see a turbocharger like this this is uh this is a 82 64s this is a very pop popular 800 horsepower turbocharger on four and five cylinder six cylinder motor uh, this turbocharger is 82 pound a minute. That means that you could flow 82 pound a minute out of this turbocharger 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we expect that it would still operate for a year that way. Hmm. That's pretty cool. That's how big the coolant jacket is that's in it. It deals with heat and it extracts the heat that good. It's quite calculatable to, to know whether or not you can handle the thermal load or not. I thought of my pay grade. I didn't even know my turbo needed to be hooked up to water. But <laughs> <laughs> it lasts a lot longer. <laughs> it lasts a lot longer. Does that, did the Tahoe have water lines running to it? Sure does. I thought, I wasn't sure if that was like a, yeah. I was like, what is yeah, that? Yeah, because the prototype turbo that I'm using uh, on the Tahoe actually has a Garrett 42R bearing housing. So uh, I'm using a ball bearing turbo on the Tahoe just so I don't have anything else to worry about other than just dealing with what I'm changing aerodynamically. Um, and it's form factor compatible for both my first level 7875 uh, fat form factor stuff and the mid grade uh, 7582 uh, stuff for the next bump up. Those are both T4 flanged.